Okay, we'll begin our uh, meeting. Good evening, everybody. Today is Wednesday, May 5th, 2021. It's now 7.01 p.m. Welcome to the annual reorganization meeting for the Adams Board of Selectmen. And what that means is tonight we're going to end up uh, electing a chair and vice chair for the next calendar year. And what that means right now is as your town administrator, I get to, to have the first three items here uh, on the agenda. So you'll have to deal with me through our procedure and protocols and then the first three items and then the new chair uh, will take over at that point. So with that being said, as we all know, we are in the middle still of a health pandemic. Thankfully, there is a light at the end of that tunnel. However, <clears throat> pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the governor's orders imposing limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place, as well as the fact that the town of Adams right now is still considered a moderate uh, classified yellow for the presence of COVID-19. This meeting of the town of Adams Board of Selectmen is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public has been permitted, but every effort has been made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in this order. Fully attending tonight remotely are members of the Board of Selectmen, member Richard Blanchard, member John Duval, member Christine Hoyt, member Joseph Novak, and new member Howard Rosenberg. Howard, on behalf of all of us, welcome to the Adams Board of Selectmen and Adams Town Government. Good to have you. Thank you. There is no one in the meeting room. This is a fully remote meeting this evening, as I said. We have posted today's agenda in accordance with open meeting law, which included the call-in information for the meeting. Despite our best efforts, if we are not able to provide for real-time access for the public to participate in today's meeting, a recording can be made available by request as this meeting is being recorded using the Zoom platform. As we are participating remotely, please note that all votes taken during this meeting will be by a roll call vote. I will state the member's name and ask for their vote for each vote necessary today. Roll call votes as a note of protocol are required even if one member is attending remotely. And as I said early, I'll be calling the meeting to order. Uh, I've read the governor's statement. Our next item on the agenda is Pledge of Allegiance. So if everyone could just join me with the Pledge of Allegiance, I'll start loud and everyone can just follow right back in. Please stand if you do wish. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, of the States, United of States of America and to, and the, republic to the republic for which, for it, stands, which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for, all. for all. Thank you all. With that, we'll move into item number three, the reorganization of the board. With that being said, my purpose tonight is just to call open the floor to hear any motions for the position of chairman of the Adams Board of Selectmen. With that, I'll open the floor. Any motions for the position of chairman, Adams Board of Selectmen? Mr. Town Administrator, I just wanted to um, say thank you to my colleagues for allowing me to serve as their chair for the last two years. Um, it is something that I have enjoyed and I appreciated their support uh, during those two years. I am not looking to um, continue to serve as chair. Um, it is a role that does take an awful lot of time. Um, it is something that I'm just not able to give at this time. Um, so I will be putting forward the nomination of John Duval as our chair, um, as I believe that he is somebody who can give the time uh, to this position as it is needed. Very well, at this time, I have a motion for John Duval to be named as chair of the Adams Select Board. We're now looking for a second. I'll second. I have a second from Mr. Blanchard. Any discussion, please? Hearing none, I have a motion from Ms. Hoyt for Mr. Duval for chair. I have a second from Mr. Blanchard. Roll call vote as follows. Member Blanchard? Yes. Mr. Duval? Yes. Member Hoyt? Yes. Mr. Novak? Yes. Mr. Rosenberg? Yes. Motion carries. Mr. Duval is now the chair. I'll open the floor for the, I'll carry you, John, one more. Uh, I have now opened the floor for any motions for vice chair, please.
if it would be helpful to the board for transitional purposes, I would um, offer myself as vice chair if anybody should want that to, to be the case. But if somebody else would like to step up and be vice chair, I'm also happy to support that. I'll nominate member Hoyt for vice chair. I have a motion by member Blanchard for member Hoyt to be nominated for vice, excuse me, named vice chair. I'm looking for a second, please. I second it. Mr. Rosenberg on the second. I have a motion on the floor for Ms. Hoyt to be named vice chair, seconded by Mr. Rosenberg. Roll call vote. Mr. Blanchard. Yes. Mr. Duval. Yes. Member Hoyt. Yes. Mr. <clears throat> Novak. Yes. Mr. Rosenberg. Yes. Motion carries. Congratulations to our new chair and vice chair. With that, Chairman Duval, I'm going to pass the proverbial camera over to you, sir. Thank you, Jay, and uh, thank you, Christine, for the last two years of your time as, as, chair, as chairperson. Um, it does take a lot of time, and uh, each chairman, each member um, is different, but you have put a tremendous amount of time into this community. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you, Jay, for uh, starting us off. The approval of minutes uh, for this evening. Next on the agenda, there are several. Um, some of these are from our workshops and some are from the uh, regular scheduled meetings. Um, so I know we've tabled uh, over the last few weeks the budget workshops. So, Christine, you might be able to help me out here. We have four of these meetings are workshops. Are they all the budget workshops? So according to my notes, and I did confirm with um, Deb Dunlap, the April 13th, 15th, and 20th uh, minutes were all tabled. Um, and that was a motion by member Blanchard. So those should probably come off the table, but everything else is, and then we can take on all the other minutes. Okay, great, thank you. So Rick, we have a motion to take off the table uh, from tabled the April 13th. 15th and 20th budget workshop minutes. Yeah, so moved. And I think I believe I seconded that motion during the budget workshop, so I'll second that. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, this is a roll call vote. Rick? Yes. Christine? Yes. Joe? Yes. Howard? Abstain. And I'll say and I'll say yes. So four in favor, one abstain. Okay, now we have a we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sets of minutes. And Christine, everyone can vote on these. I'm not sure that is Dev online too. No, uh, April 21st. Uh, John cannot. Correct. So I will make a motion. There you go. The board waive a reading of the minutes for April 7th, April 13th, April 15th, April 20th, April 26th, and April 27th of 2021 and approve them as provided. Motion by Rick. Do we have a second? I will second. Second by Christine. Any discussion on that on those sets of minutes? Just one comment. Um, I do want to thank uh, Deb Dunlap. This is an, a tremendous amount of work to pull together all of these minutes, especially with all of the workshops and meetings that we have had in the month of April, and to do so in a timely fashion. Um, I just wanted to make sure that that point is made and that she is thanked for, for this quick turnaround. Well said. Any further discussion? Hearing none, this is a roll call vote. Rick? Yes. Joe? Yes. Christine? Yes. Howard? Dane? And yes. So we have four in favor, one abstention. I will make a motion that uh, we waive a reading of the minutes and approve them as provided for April 21st, 2021. Okay, we have a motion by Rick. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Second by Christine. Any discussion? Hearing none. This is a roll call vote. Rick? Yes. Joe? Yes. Christine? Yes. 
I'm going to abstain and Howard. Abstain. Okay, three in favor, two abstentions. Okay, that's it for approval of minutes. Next is public comment. Does anyone who has called in have anything they would like to discuss with the board or any item that is not on tonight's agenda? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. We are now on to new business. The first item is approval of common VIC license application. This is for the Rainbow Shack, 85 Summer Street in Adams. So Jay, do you have this one? Yes, I can quickly go over this. So uh, a common VIC license so that everybody understands is generally, and I see that Mark is on the call and Dr. Rhodes on the call too. So if I misspeak, I'm sure I'll be corrected. Uh, generally speaking, a, a common VIC license is issued to an establishment that has uh, food service with seating installed. Rainbow Shack apparently had never had a common VIC before from what we understand. However, although they don't intend to offer indoor seating at this time, uh, they are missing that license. So this is a routine application for the board's, uh, uh, board's desire to issue such license to Rainbow Shack, which I think all of us at this point would love to be able to have a normal <laughs> summer with some ice cream. <laughs> Definitely. Um, any discussion uh, from the board? Any discussion from anyone representing the Rainbow Shack? It seems to be pretty uh, straightforward. Yeah, I don't think we have anybody. Uh, when Deb and I checked this afternoon, I don't think we have anybody representing them here tonight. Okay. Okay, so hearing no discussion from the board, this is a, I need a motion. Approve. I'll make a motion to approve the common Vic license application for Rainbow Shack operating at 85 Summer Street in Adams. Motion by Christine. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second by Rick. Any further discussion? Um, I would just like to make a comment. Um, I'm very happy to see that the Rainbow Shack is open. It certainly is one of the better uh, businesses in town during the summer months and it's family oriented oriented and i'm very happy that uh they're opened again they serve the community well thank you joe anyone else okay this is a roll call vote rick yes joe yes christine yes howard yes and yes for me Motion is approved and passes. Next on the agenda, still under new business item B is approval of Sunday entertainment license. Pastor Dave Anderson of the First Baptist Church, North Adams. And the event is to be held at 161 B Spring Road, which is the Burnett Farm on May 30th of this year. Um, Jay, you got this one too, I assume, right? Yep, sure. I can tee this one up for everybody. So uh, this is great to see that we're we're back to uh, some events now. Just uh, for clarity, this event is is not on public property. This event is proposed to be on private property. Nonetheless, in order to have this type of event, there's a couple of different uh, town related permits that that need to be taken care of. Uh, Pastor Dave is taking care of those with town staff. Uh, but the one that requires the board to look at is the issuance of a Sunday entertainment license specifically for outdoor music. I know that everyone's pretty much ready at this point. Also, in addition to ice cream, to have some live music. So thankfully, Pastor Dave uh, is with us uh, tonight. Dave can uh, certainly walk us through what the proposal is, what the hours are, uh, et cetera. I can also tell you that he's been in touch with uh, Board of Health, Code Enforcement Officer Mark Blaisdell, uh, because, of course, everything that we do right now has that additional layer of regulation on top of it for health reasons. So the board is just being asked tonight to take a look at a routine issuance of a routine Sunday entertainment license. And with Dave, feel free to uh, take the floor. The board will ask any questions that they may have. Thank you so much for giving us a few minutes tonight. Um, our hope is, as a church, to do an outdoor music festival on Sunday, the 30th of May starting at one o'clock in the afternoon and going until 6.30, so it'll be done before dark. 
Um, we have five musical performers who are gonna be a part of this event plus one speaker. Um, we're gonna be setting a stage up um, on the property and have a huge meadow for people to sit on and spread out on and that sort of thing. Um, we are gonna have a food truck on site um, to facilitate uh, meals and that sort of thing during the event. Um, in the line for the food truck per COVID stuff, we're gonna have cones every six feet to kind of deal with um, spacing. Um, we're gonna have four porta potties on site. Each of those are gonna be six feet apart. And again, we're gonna have cones in place to deal with um, the COVID uh, restrictions. Um, as a church over the last uh, year and a half or so, we have been following uh, all the guidelines pretty closely as a church and that will be the case for um, this event. We are going to have a volunteer group of uh, eight people that are going to be doing parking um, and security kind of things. We're going to have a group of eight volunteers that are going to be doing general hospitality, meeting needs and taking care of people um, throughout the uh, event as well. Um, we are going to be mapping out kind of our plan for parking up here. Um, the event is going to be up at the top, the end of uh, Spring Road. Um, and uh, the plan is a little bit later this month to um, hand deliver a letter to all the residents on Spring Road that there's going to be a little more traffic than normal um, on that day early afternoon and then the evening once the event is done. Um, we are going to be charging $25 per car load. Um, we're not doing tickets per person. It's just per car load. So if there's two or six or whatever, we'll have folks um, coming in. Um, tickets will be um, pre-sold online. Um, and we are hoping for a crowd of somewhere around two to 250. Um, and as of right now, my understanding is the outdoor um, cap on, on gatherings is 250, so we're going to uh, do our best to adhere to that. Um, so uh, I passed in our, our paperwork. I wasn't quite sure how to do the um, licensing fee for that, so that's something I can drop off in the next day or so. And then um, we reached out to our insurance company the last couple of days, and I had emailed to me just later this afternoon um, the deck page for our church's insurance policy. Um, so I will drop that off at town hall as well. Um, for the church, our policy covers not just only events that we do at the church building, but whether we take trips or mission trips or do special events off site like this, our policy covers those kinds of things as well. Hey, thank you, Pastor Dave. Um, questions from the board. I'll go around the room. Uh, Rick? Uh, nothing at the time. Okay. Joe? Uh, no, I have no questions. Christine? No questions. Just uh, thank you to Pastor Dave for attending this evening to walk us through your plans. Absolutely. Thank you. And Howard? No questions. So, uh, Jay, the only question I, or the question I have is that we have not received the insurance form yet. Um, I think and the license fee, I believe. So is that, so if the board approves this evening, it's going to be conditional on the submittal of those two items. Is there anything else? No, uh, Dave is, we have Dave plugged in with some of the other folks from uh, town staff, including chief of police, just to be able to mitigate anything that may uh, for traffic related. Uh, so okay. Dave's on top of that. Um, and yes, you're correct, John. I would just recommend a, a conditional approval at this time. Okay. Um, so we're looking for a motion for a conditional approval. I'll make a motion that the board approve <laughs> the Sunday entertainment license for the First Baptist Church, North Adams, conditionally, uh, upon receiving the insurance, proof of insurance, and payment for the license. I second it. And we have a second from Howard. No, Jay, is that that's good? Yes, sir. Okay, that includes it. All right. Is there any further discussion from the board? Uh, uh, this is Joe. I'd just like to make a comment to the pastor. 
Uh, while you're there, please have a moment of silence for Doug and Jane. They're two angels in heaven. Okay. Joe, thank you. Do you know who this is? <laughs> uh, probably Kim or Carrie. Yes, it's Kim. I miss you, Joe. Thank you for that. Okay. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Very good. Um, any other discussion from the board? Hearing none, this is a roll call vote. Rick? Yes. Joe? Yes. Christine? Yes. Howard? Yes. And yes from me, it's unanimous vote. It's approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will have the fees and the insurance information there tomorrow. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay, next on the agenda is review of 2021 town election and open positions. Town Clerk Haley Mesmore. Haley. Good evening. Um, first, I want to say thank you to everybody who helped make it such a successful election this year. Um, from our DPW crew to all of our poll workers to the police department, um, town hall staff that helped and pitched in to do a few things and our custodians and anybody else that I'm forgetting. Um, and congratulations to everybody who won. So let's get to the nitty gritty where we do have a few vacancies that still exist after we've had the election. Um, the Board of Health um, still has one vacancy that was not filled and we have um, two seat um, for park commission um, with for three years and then we have one seat for a um, two year position um, on the Parks Commission. So um, moving forward with that, um, and town council can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the appointment to fill a vacancy in a town office is um, where the commission or the board of or the board would notify the board of selectmen. But of course, we're doing that tonight, anyways, and they're definitely aware of it, and so are you. That there's vacancies that need to be filled. Um, with that being said, you need to. Um, if the selectmen want to fill these, then we need to give notice out, and then we have, then you have to come together with a joint commission or the board, and then do um, an appointment. So. Okay, so so that's precedence. We've done this in the past, I believe. Correct. Uh, a question for. Well, let's see, the Board of Health needs one member, so they can still meet, right? They have two members and they're down one, so they still can hold a meeting. The Parks Commission, which is made up of a total of five members, they are down three members, so they, at this time, they're unable to hold a meeting because they do not have a quorum of members. So the question I have for Attorney St. John is, I, I think this is what you put forward and, and what Haley mentioned is that um, the Bo Board of Selectmen uh, will uh, put out a uh, recruitment notice for each board um, after tonight's announcement looking for anyone who is um, uh, willing to serve on one of these two boards. Um, what, until the, um, Parks Commission um, has a quorum. If there's anything that needs to be taken care of from that board, is it how is that done? Is it done by the Board of Selectmen since the Parks Commission is a uh, recommending body? So in the absence of the Park Commission, um, there's a statute that provides that the Board of Selectmen make those decisions that the park commissions can't make by, by reason of a lack of a quorum. Okay. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Coach Jim Fassel who's been on the Parks Commission for many years. So if he has any inputs he'd like to provide, that would be welcome. I, I think it's, it's important for us to function and then we, we um, discuss the usage of the fields and the um, quality control of Russell Field and Renfrew 
and we we do need members um, to fulfill that. It be, it became a very difficult process to get fifty signatures to to qualify for running for office this time. So there is a thought where you could make make the park commission's positions um, appointed and maybe then it would satisfy. I know at least two, two members that would love to be part of it, but they, they, um, they, couldn't, they couldn't get the signatures. One used the old fashioned method of going up to the, the dump on Saturday, but nobody wanted to talk to him. He says, get away, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So it, it may behoove the board to, to make this a um, appointed position versus an elected one. That's it. All right, thank you, Coach. So that's what we're gonna do this year. We're going to look to appoint enough members so you have a quorum. Um, Jay, so if anything comes up that needs action, by the Parks and Rec, we can hold a workshop or we can have it at a regular scheduled meeting to take action with consultation from Jim uh, or the other and the other board member. We can take care of it that way until a quorum is done identified, right? Yeah, we'll keep we can keep everything working. As of right now, uh, the only item that was left when I talked to Foreman Scrocky uh, today was he was still working on water for Renfrew. You know, Russell still is uh, on, on uh, turf hold in order to allow that. Everything else should be operating normally. Uh, I don't believe we've had any additional facility use requests, but we can certainly uh, incorporate any of those items into any agenda moving forward and keep the business going and keep the facilities being used. Okay. Chair Chairman Duval, I also just want to make mention that um, Jake Schutz is also on this call and he is the other parks commissioner. So I don't know if he had anything. Hi, <clears throat> no, I uh, I agree with Coach, but I don't have anything else to add. I know Paul in the wiki was interested in, in a write-in campaign because he wasn't able to get enough signatures. So there are people out there willing to participate if uh, once you put the call out for uh, potential appointees. Okay, thank you, Jake. Um, so in our packets uh, for the board, we, we do have recruitment notices, um, either Haley or possibly Christine, if you don't mind, if you to, to uh, read each of these. Volunteers? Can do it. Go ahead, Haley. Yep. Okay. Um, I'll read the, a potential um, recruitment notice for Parks um, Commission members. And this one was used um, a few years, was it used last year when we were filling some positions for the Parks Commission. So the Town of Adams is seeking applicant applications for, from candidates interested in serving on the Parks Commission. And this would be until May of 2022. The commission serves in an advisory capacity to the Board of Selectmen with the focus on facility and field usage requests for parks, playgrounds and recreational activities within the town. The commission meets regularly on the second Monday of the month and candidates that are interested should provide a letter of interest, including any training credentials or background of the or background to the office of the Board of Selectmen at 8 Park Street or by email they can email Deb Dunlap um, and we'll have you'll have to set a time when you want to do that it looks like you know maybe if you put it out for two weeks or something that might work so um, I'm sure Deb can um, get this um, updated and we can get it on the town website and I'm sure it'll get posted on um, Facebook too. So again, anybody that's interested in serving on the Parks Commission or they can even call Town Hall um, and speak to Deb's office um, in the Board of Selectmen or if they happen to call my office, I can forward it off a recruitment notice once it's posted. Um, for the Board of Health member, same thing, um, the Town of Adams will accept applications from a candidate that's interested in serving on the Board of Health. And this would again be until May of 2022. 
Responsibilities are mandated under Mass General Law, state and local regulations and community direction. Board of Health members are responsible for taking measures to prevent and control disease, health and environmental protection and promoting healthy community. Um, the board typically meet, I think the first Wednesday of every month, just so that people know that. So it's, it's typically a one month meeting, sometimes two, Mr. Rose can correct me if I'm wrong. And certainly if anybody's interested, again, they could contact the Board of Selectmen office, the Board of Health office, or Deb Dunlap in the Selectmen's office. And I would assume that that would probably be out for uh, like a two week period too. So anybody serving. And then obviously, you know, what Mr. Fassel was just saying about, you know, maybe making the Parks Commission an appointed board or a commission, if that's what you want to call it, that would be something that I believe in town council can correct me if I'm wrong, that we would, you know, just change it by charter or, you know, going to um, town meeting to do something like that. So that is, uh, I'll jump in there. Sorry, Ed, but this, I'll, I'll spare you the, that. Uh, this is one of those provisions along with uh, how we elect assessor, treasurer, collector, and town clerk. This is all required by special act, which makes up the town charter in, in whole. And in order to modify that, it cannot be modified alone by town meeting. It must be modified with authorization by town meeting to submit home rule petition to the state legislature to modify our enabling special act. So we've had a lot of uh, conversation at the board level and at the staff level about uh, modifying some of these positions. So I think coach is, is correct that it would probably be easier for folks who have an interest in serving in these capacities, not have to mount uh, an old fashioned election uh, for essentially a volunteer public service position. So it's definitely something that we need to look at down the road. It's achievable. It's just unfortunately one of those things that's a little bit more time consuming uh, in order to, to modify. But I would suggest that uh, at least in my conversations with the board, and I don't wanna speak for the board, John, you can certainly uh, jump in. That is something we'll be looking at down the road as our, our time allows us to do. Thanks, Jay. Definitely we'll be looking into that. Um, does anyone on the Board of Selectmen have any uh, input or any questions on uh, the process we're going to go or the two recruitment notices that Haley has provided. Okay, seems like everyone's good with this. I don't believe we need to have a vote, right? No, John, I just had a, a question. I think, do we have to post it for a minimum of two weeks? I feel like that was the past practice, but I don't know if that's so I guess I'm looking at Attorney St. John and, and Haley, if somebody might know the answer to that, if there's a minimum requirement for how long it has to be posted. It actually looks like um, I'm reading the um, section right now. And it says, who with the remaining board members of such board shall after one week's notice fill such, such vacancy with a roll call. So, I mean, you could probably just go out for a week if you wanted to. I just, I had just suggested probably past practice has been two weeks, but it's strictly up to the board, whatever um, you deem is, you know, what you want to do. I'd also add that that one week uh, that Haley talked about is a minimum. So you could go out two weeks if you chose. I think I'd like to see two weeks. Anybody else, everybody else good with that? Yep. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll do it for two weeks. That sounds fair. All right. Does anyone uh, for this agenda item, does anyone else have any input on um, these open positions? Um, uh, this is Joe. I have no input on the positions, but I would like to ask Kaylee a question uh, of the review of the 2021 town elections. And my question to Haley is, what percentage of registered voters voted in uh, Monday's election? I'm going to say, I'm just looking for my paper, 14.7. Um, yeah, I, I, that that really bothers me. I, I don't know. I know that you, you and everyone else in this community uh, try to get the word out to vote, but the apathy um, I've seen in 
you know, in the last, I don't know how many years, is kind of pathetic. It just, I don't know, it, it, it kind of bothers me quite a bit. It's just like people with the civic responsibilities uh, just don't do it. It's so much different during a presidential year, which, of course, should be the case. But, um, you know, our town elections seem to be, you know, way below par and below standards. And I think it may be uh, throughout all of Berkshire County. I don't know the turnouts from other communities. I know, of course, Cheshire was quite low. But do you have any uh, thought on why that is the case, uh, Haley? Um, I, I really don't. I don't know. I mean, obviously, a presidential election draws out everybody. Um, I have no idea why um, our voters, you know, do not come out for our local election. As you and I know, and the rest of the board and everybody probably on the call, that's this is where it starts. So hopefully um, somebody's going to get the, you know, we can get the message out and hopefully we can get more voters out to vote in our town election. It's very, very important. You know, I can't stress it enough. Yeah, I agree with you, Haley. Democracy starts at home. You're right. Haley, I just have a quick question in regards to a, another subject. It's the uh, federal census, and the federal government has started to provide census information at a very high level. Um, do we have any idea when the uh, numbers will get down to the individual cities and towns of the, of the, of the states? Um, I haven't heard when we're going to be hearing about our number here in Adams. Yeah. Um, I have gotten emails and I participated in, um, in a couple of Zoom. Um, and the problem that, well, hopefully we'll hear soon, but um, what I'm seeing and what we may have to do is um, draw our precinct lines differently than what we currently have. So um, I'm just waiting to see what's gonna happen with that. Hopefully we don't have to redraw our precinct lines, but, um, there is a possibility that that's going to have to happen. And what triggers that? Um, the number that that's within each of the precinct. There's a certain percentage that each one has to have. So, um, but then again, you still have, like ours are drawn with landmarks and you have to be mindful of all of that. So um, we'll be doing more Zoom meetings that, you know, have to relate to that. But um, yeah, and it's a very short timeline too. Once they tell us like uh, what our numbers are, we only have about a month to like redraw our precinct. So um, it'll be pretty rigorous, but it, we probably won't hear till summer um, what our numbers really are. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and if I could, uh, I would just like to say that it appears through the population drop within uh, the Western part of the state that both our state rep up here in uh, Berkshire County, John Barrett, and perhaps uh, Mark, uh, their districts will maybe be uh, made larger, and also our congressional uh, district uh, may also expand to cover other uh, communities uh, farther out in the eastern part of the state. So it's, once again, um, population and numbers make a big difference and we just don't have them. Okay, thank you, Haley. Um, next on the agenda is ratification of wastewater treatment plant operator number one, uh, Jay. Thank you, uh, Chairman Duvall. So as everybody may know, we do have two vacancies presently at the Adams wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this evening, uh, you'll be asked to, to ratify who could be our newest employee at the wastewater treatment plant, Ms. Kristen Doolittle. She's on the call this evening, and I've also asked Superintendent Bob Rumble, our longtime plant superintendent, uh, on the call tonight. You have the uh, appointment letters, I believe, uh, in your packet. You can certainly read those, John, if you'd like, um, and we can have Bob say a, a few words, and Kristen's been kind enough and been patient on the call say hello so everybody can see what she looks like because once she starts working at the plant, you probably won't see her again. So uh, Kristen, welcome. And uh, John, I'll turn it back over to you for your pleasure. Thank you, Jay. Bob, do you have anything you'd like to add? 
Excuse me? Do you have any, anything you'd like to add to the uh, conversation? Um, uh, what I would like to say is I was very impressed with Mrs. Doolittle's interview. She brings a lot to the table. Um, she has a lot of enthusiasm. I did reach out to her references. Um, one of the four returned my phone call, and the review that he gave me gave me more confidence from when we had her down at the plant. Um, what I did is I had each department head take her around and let her experience what was going on at the plant and everyone came back and said out of the five people we have interviewed at the plant she is probably the best fit for us and that is great to hear I'll yes. read the, and i'll read the uh, letter from uh, jay to the board of selectmen uh, then the board will take action um, dear select board, the, this letter is to advise the Board of Selectmen that subject to the board's ratification as provided in Section 10 of the Town Charter, Kristen Doolittle has been appointed to the position of Wastewater Treatment Plant Operator 1. Ms. Doolittle has expressed sincere interest, aptitude, and willingness to develop her skills in wastewater treatment, seek her operator's license, and is eager to embark on a new career with the Town of Adams. Subject to hiring requirements, Ms. Doolittle will begin her duties on May 10, 2021 at the Wastewater Operator 1, Step 1 rate of $18.67 per hour. What is the board's pleasure? I will make a motion that the board ratify the appointment of Kristen Doolittle to the position of Wastewater Operator 1, Step 1 rate of $18.67 per hour. Effective May 10th, 2021. We have a motion by Rick. Do we have a second? A second. Second by Christine. Any discussion? Um, I have a question, and I asked this question of all people that are ratified for jobs. Um, is Kristen a resident of Adams? Yes. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome, Joe. Any further discussion? Hearing none, this is a roll call vote. Rick? Yes. Joe? Yes. Christine? Yes. Howard? Yes. And yes, it's unanimous decision. Thank you. Thank you, Select Board. Kristen, you want to say hi? You want to say anything? You've been patient. Uh, I'm just happy to start, with you guys, and I can't wait. I'm glad I got this opportunity. Great, welcome to the team. Thank you. Kristen, Bob, thank you for your time. You're both, uh, feel feel free to uh, drop off. No need to stay on. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. I'll talk to you later, Jay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is textile bin and transfer station. Uh, Northern Berkshire Solid Waste District. We do have Linda Cernick here. Um, Jay, do you have anything to say before Linda gives us an overview? I'm just going to toss over real quick. Linda is certainly the subject matter expert. You know, this is a, a an example as to, you know, we're, we're often asked, maybe not often, but periodically asked, you know, why is Adams a member of the Northern Berkshire Solid Waste Management District? You know, what do we get for that? People see it in the budget. They wonder. This is one of the reasons why we are. Uh, it's programming. It is, you know, these are things that we do not do at town staff. We don't have the staff to do these things. Linda brings all of this uh, to the table. So I will turn it over to her to explain what this opportunity is. Um, the highlights are essentially no cost. We're ahead of the curve in terms of uh, what will likely be another probably uh, waistband stream restriction down the road. Uh, but we're, we're pleased tonight to present Linda and, and explain what exactly this, this program is and opportunity is. Thank you very much, Jay. And, um... I'm glad to be here. Um, I wanted to point out the waistband compliance um, as Christine put up on uh, for you to all review. Um, Mass DEP in November of 2020 held public hearings and they're looking to implement um, textiles in mattresses in the waistband compliance, which means that textiles could not be thrown into the waistband, into your trash. 
So bringing on the textile bin with apparel impact, now before the um, regulation starts, we're ahead of the game and providing resources for the residents to bring textiles to the transfer station. I think it's like a one-stop shop with all of the programs that we have at the transfer station for recycling. Did you want to put the uh, apparel impact flyer up? Christine? Is this the one? Questions on the um, <clears throat> waistband compliance? No, and then Linda, is this the flyer you wanted up? Yes, but then the apparel, um, the acceptable items, did I get send that to you? Yes, it should be on the screen, I hope. It's not on there, that's okay. So, that's all right. That's okay. So we've partnered with um, Apparel Impacts out of New Hampshire. <laughs> they have a 650 bins between Massachusetts and New York. Um, they're an excellent company. Uh, we just started this program and this gives an idea of all the items that are accepted into the bins. Anything can go in there except for items that are wet or moldy and everything is repurposed. 30% of the items stay within the US and the rest is sent overseas. We also have bins at the Pizza House and Adams, um, I think the Adams Express. Last year, Adams diverted over 7,000 pounds of clothing from the waste stream, which I think is excellent. So adding this to the transfer station is gonna divert thousands more. And I think it's gonna be, it's a nice, it's a one-stop shop. We have textile programming, we have tire recycling, we have a universal waste, which is fluorescent light bulbs, batteries, ballast, and smoke detector recycling. We have compost recycling, which is leaves, grass, and household brush, paper and cardboard, plastic and glass. And we also have a, a, a shed for all uh, deposit cans that go to the Boy Scouts, all the proceeds go to the Boy Scouts. So we have a nice array of um, recycling programs. Any questions? Mark, Just one. want to add? Yes, Rick. Yep. Uh now, do they monitor that frequently? Yes, they, they, they come around on a rolling basis. They will probably be, I, I don't know what the schedule is, but they come through Williamstown, New Ashford, Windsor, Adams, Cheshire, um, all of the transfer stations use apparel impact. So that will be cleaned out periodically. It will not get overly, you know, it's not gonna get full and clothing's gonna come out of it. And if it does, we'll call them, but they, we come on a rolling basis and clean that out. Right. And, think, uh, do you speak to them or um, I think Robert was there when they delivered. Robert, are you on? Uh, Linda, I did speak. I, I think it was every two weeks that they come through there. So there's no need to uh, for us to have a attendant, you know, um, check the stock. It'll be every two weeks. So it's, it's no it's no effort really to do that. Okay. My other question, now these are the, the, the picture that was sent in our packet. This would be uh, the boxes? Yes. All right. It looks like it's to prevent people from climbing in them. Is it so? I don't think you could climb in them. I think they're a safe, I mean, I don't know. That's a good question. Know, Linda, you can't get in there. The, the, the door opening is such a way, it's almost like a V. So when it's open now, there's a piece of metal in the back so you can't climb in, then you lift it up and it, it'll drop it in there. Person, unless they're very small or something, they're not gonna get inside there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? I'm excited to have this program. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, Mark and Robert for uh, and the whole board for um, approving this at the transfer station. I think it's going to be an asset and it's going to prevent uh, you know, things from going into the waste stream. Thank you, Linda. Um, yep. 
Jay, does, do you think this needs a motion or is it's already up there, right? It, it's up there it's, with no cost to the town under administrative. We, we, we had it up there. It's, you know, if it was something that was going to be of cost or whatever, the board could have certainly taken a look at it, but we, we've got it up there. This is kind of a, a no brainer can certainly vote to endorse, but no need for anything formal. I did want to mention one event we're having Saturday. We have our Shred Fest, which is a paper shredding event. Um, it's free for all member towns, 13 member towns residents. <clears throat> we're holding it in Williamstown from nine to noon on Simons Road. We welcome anyone. And if people want to give donations, the money goes back into the district for um, additional recycling events. And we used our Recycling Dividends Grant Awards money for this. Okay, sounds good. Anything else from the Board of Selectmen? Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we're moving on to field and park usage. Code Enforcement Officer Blaisdell. Jay, do you have anything to say before we get into the discussion? No, again, just teeing up for Mark like with, with everybody else. Um, you know, COVID-19 has, has certainly engaged the Board of Health and code enforcement in certain areas where traditionally and historically they have not been involved. Uh, even though we are winding down, hopefully, knock on wood, uh, COVID-19, we did receive a lot of questions. I know board members uh, were inquiring a lot as to what the regulations are for park usage. How is that regulated? How is, what is the town doing? Is the town doing anything beyond what the state's doing? What is the state doing? Mark is a subject matter expert. Uh, it is the jurisdiction of the, of the Board of Health, even though we may authorize use of the field for its intended function, say Little League Baseball. Uh, these state public health orders in a state of emergency also control how that team can play. So uh, we felt there was a lot of questions and it was best to, to have Mark present. So with that, uh, I can turn it over to the board for any targeted questions that Mark can answer or Mark can just start uh, explaining exactly particularly what happened at the, the last Parks Commission meeting where he presented at that time. Mark, do you mind going over um, the status of the, uh, the fields and the, and the leagues and what happened at the last Parks meeting? Sure, there, there were um, seven organizations that requested to use the fields, uh, two at Reed, two at Valley Street, and two at Renfrew. Uh, there was a seventh application that came in today. I don't know if uh, if Jay was familiar with that one, the Berkshire Adult Baseball League. Okay, so that's the last one that came in. So of the, the six that went before the Parks Commission, uh, five had uh, also requested use of the restroom, and so let me uh, transition to the public health order, which is our local um, overwrite of, of the state standards. So with, with regard to the, athlete, the athletic fields that have restrooms and concessions, if they wanted to use those facilities, they would have to make special requests for that because there's also some standards uh, that they have to follow with regard to that. Um, so in that public health order, I did make uh, a couple of updates on number two, uh, indicated that uh, other activities such as festivals, uh, road races and whatnot, they needed to submit a, uh, a COVID safety plan 10 days ahead of the event. Um, item number six was uh, input from Superintendent Dean that the Plunkett Field would remain closed for activities outside of school use. And then on number 13 is where I indicated that uh, any organization requesting use of the restrooms or, or concessions uh, submit the separate page two of the facilities use request um, and uh, all youth and adult sports organizers would submit also their game schedules two weeks in advance. And the last update was uh, the previous order had a $300 fine uh, the state now allows for a $1,000 fine. Uh, so each of the sports organizations, the, the first six, were given copies of, of this order as well as the state standard from the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, 
uh, that was put into effect March 22nd, amended April 16th, and then is going to be amended again uh, on May 10th. And that's it. So, Mark, I noticed that the the minor leaguers were were already uh, playing up on Valley. I think the soccer league may have already started. Um, have all the leagues provided a plan and uh, to adhere to the rules? Have they their group to start? Yes, all of them have, and we uh, we did give them permission uh, to begin uh, their practices. And last weekend was the opening day for the little league. Uh, so they had a two-day event up there. And another question is um, the softball leagues. I know we have two softball leagues, and one plays down at um, Russell. So how did they work out that situation? No one has been authorized to use Russell Field. Right. So they're so both softball softball leagues are going to use Reed. Yes. Okay. Okay, any questions from the board? Uh, yes, I have a question. I had a few calls from uh, people, um, parents in particular, and one of them submitted a question to me that I'm going to ask you. Um, I realize that each town and community sets the rules that best fits what's going on with COVID in the area. But this was the question, why the limitations on attendance at sports events, both at schools and parks, beyond that of which the state of Massachusetts imposed? Uh, because a lot of people want to go see their kids play uh, sports um, and grandparents because, you know, they're just proud to see you know, their loved ones playing and, you know, and it also adds a little bit of excitement. So how does it stand for people wanting to go and uh, watch a game in an open field? I'm not talking about in, in an enclosed area as far as going to a field to watch a softball game, a soccer game, a t-ball game, and so on and so forth, football. So where does that stand as far as attendance from parents and people interested in watching uh, the game? So diminishing the congregation, um, we just, as, as Jay mentioned uh, at the onset of the meeting, we just came out of the red for, for several weeks, and we are in the yellow. Um, we would expect that as our numbers diminish and we get into the gray, um, that we would uh, lift those restrictions as well as make some additional modifications to the public health order. Okay, so in other words, as it stands now, if people were going to go to a game to watch it, um, if they're family members, they could sit together. And if you're singular, if you're six feet away from somebody, um, is that considered enough spacing to go and watch a game? So the restriction we put in place was uh, two spectators per player, and at a sporting event, um, you do have you do have people commingling co and incorporate in that um, concessions and, and restroom visits. Um, you you will, um, as as the public or as our parks commission experienced um, last season was that you're, you're going to have people within close contact. So, so our intention was to diminish uh, the number of people who would be in attendance spectating and then potentially commingling, whether it be intentional or non-intentional. Okay, and my last question regarding that is, um, how can you realistically um, make sure that all of this, which you've just mentioned to me, can be uh, adhered to? Each organization has uh, submitted a, an attestation that they will ensure that their, their players and their spectators would adhere to uh, 
uh, the state and local standards. Okay, so in other words, it's almost like an honesty system, right? The, the primary enforcement is by the event organizer. Okay, thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Rick, do you have any questions? I'm sorry, no, I do not. Christine? Yeah, so um, question about the, the process. Um, so Mark, you mentioned um, we and our a, a few times when mentioning the public health order. So when you mention we and our, are you talking about the Board of Health? Did this go through the Board of Health and be approved by the Board of Health before it was issued? And did you nope. have, and my second part to that question is, did you have any input from the Parks Commission um, before putting out the public health order? So I, I am an authorized agent of the Board of Health. Um, the draft of the revision was, was sent to other town officials, including the Parks Commission. And at the last Parks Commission meeting, we did discuss the order and, um, and it was in a draft form at that point. And then um, after the next day after that discussion, um, it, the modifications were made and finalized and then signed and, and put on the town's website. And a copy of the order was then sent to those, uh, those six organizations. Okay, so there's been no input from the Board of Health officially on this order. Correct, it's not required. Oh, but David does want to weigh in. Yep. Uh, Officer Blaisdell does keep us informed. So if we have an issue, we can definitely call him and uh, and uh, modify. And so, so yes, he is our authorized agent. And as long as, uh, as we agree with what he's doing, uh, we appreciate uh, his uh, uh, initiative in uh, keeping the town safe and yes we we do have oversight and have not seen necessary to uh to uh use that at this point neighbor yeah so i have a question uh, and nothing gets marked but the process is the process of the board of health approves these orders would when the board have to meet to approve the order i uh, no, no because uh these are orders that that are uh, public health related, and we do not we do not need to approve them. Um, like I said, if if, if necessary, we uh, we would modify. But uh, as, as long as uh, Officer Blaisdell is is essentially following uh, state mandate and guidelines, uh, Department of Public Health guidelines. Uh, he's he's well within his authority. So so typically, what I do is is I contact the chairman um, with with drafts, and then we have a discussion, um, make whatever adjustments we feel are necessary, um, and then I'm required by statute within two days of posting the order uh, to notify the the board members, and I and I have historically done that. Okay, thanks. Um, Howard, do you have any questions? I, I do not. Okay. Anyone else have any questions on this topic? Anyone in the audience, anybody to bring up a question? Hearing none. Okay, thank you, everyone. Okay, that is it for new business. Next on the agenda is department reports. Town Administrator, Jay. Thank you, John. Um, moving quickly tonight, we'll do a, because we're kind of talking about impacts of, of COVID-19, I'll just quickly go over kind of what I think the future is gonna be for our public buildings. Right now, our public buildings uh, generally remain limited. I would use that term to describe them. Our library is operating with browsing by appointment. Um, not unlike other, other facilities. So let everybody know, call the library, make an appointment, go right over and browse as usual. 
that too is a control just to, in order to limit, <coughs> excuse me, number of people in the building. Cows on Aging is working by appointment with no large group programming at this time. And town hall, of course, remains open by appointment only with plenty of remote options. I do not necessarily think, again, knock on wood, that this will continue beyond, say, somewhere in the May to June range. I would think certainly by July 1, we'll probably be back to, to being open fully. I would expect some limitations in terms of whether or not we have a sign-in sheet, whether or not we try to uh, recruit a volunteer greeter in order to do a temperature check, just to you know, remind people just to control that again to protect the, the workforce. Um, my concern, as I mentioned earlier, and as illustrated also by Mark, and I would think that David would agree, as long as the community community is classified in the red or in the yellow, that does indicate the presence of COVID-19 at a, at a level that could promote community spread. Therefore, even though you may see other, other communities opening up, we are somewhat a little bit behind that as long as we have those DPH numbers. Is it cautionary? Is it conservative? Yes, it is. I just think at this point, we've, we're, we're almost there. We're functioning. We have, you know, people call up all the time and make appointments at town hall. We're okay. So uh, at this point, I would say that if we go into the green or if we, uh, even luckier, if we drop into the gray, personally, in a, and at some point, Mark and I will have this conversation, we'll have this conversation with Dr. Rhodes as well. At what point do we want to see green for how long? Or at what point do we want to see gray for how long? In my mind, and I'm conservative with this stuff simply because I'd like to protect the workforce, we'd like gray for two weeks. Um, but at the same time, you know, it is time to, to reopen and get back to normal operation. Uh, most of the first floor on, uh, in town hall is already in there, uh, you know, protected with the, the plexiglass, which was put in in the 96 uh, renovation of the building. Second floor offices, we've reached out. Anyone that wants a plexiglass, you know, barrier to have there will have it. Of course, anyone can mask up and we'll figure out as we go. You know, I, I would suggest that as the public come to the building, they're going to probably be, be asked to, to mask up. I would also say that all of our boards, all of our commissions, the select board, et cetera, at that point can probably begin to meet in person. Some already have, as they know. And I would think that for a period of time, particularly with the room capacities, you know, the rooms as beautiful as they are in the building aren't exactly made to spread out. We'll just have to watch the capacity limitations. Um, and you may have seen, you know, some of the newspaper articles about how the remote access to public meetings has really revolutionized local government. Uh, we have bought those, those two uh, very large conference centers. We'll figure out how to integrate those and we'll figure out how to use our space better in town hall so that they're always set up. A board can always meet and always have remote access. Um, I, I would also put forth that I would anticipate a board can probably meet in person. And then eventually what we would probably do is allow people who have items before that board or before that commission to attend in person. That also limits the number of people in the room. And then eventually as the, the numbers look good, the vaccination rate goes up, we hopefully achieve herd immunity and then we can open it back up. Uh, however, no matter what we do, I think it's important for people to know we'll always have at least remote access. We just wanna be smart about it. Um, and, and go from there. So I know that um, we're going to be looking at the rooms and, and that, but we're almost ready to go. Library's uh, ready to go. Uh, I'm going to transcend also into um, Adams Memorial. We're doing some work in there now uh, in order to, to continue on prep to move Council on Aging over. Why do we want to do that? It's not just the board's decision to, to use Adams Memorial for Council on Aging purposes. They can spread out more over there. Uh, so I know Erica has the tent plan. As soon as we, we can, we'll be having uh, some, some events over there. She'll work with Board of Health, Code Enforcement on that as well. But uh, if we can get some indoor programming over at Council on Aging where people can spread out, we'll, we'll still be able to operate in the function. So that's kind of where we, we want to go there. Shifting gears over to uh, DPW work, just want to let everybody know Howland Avenue has not escaped anyone's attention. Um, we're waiting to hear from Mass Highway on some guidelines for what's called a transportation uh, bond bill. 
that allows a town of Adams that has a roadway that is part of the state route numbered system, but is municipal maintained uh, to a, a, apply for funds for resurfacing. Uh, so that road needs more than just what's called an overlay. It needs some significant work. It's probably about a million dollars. We've talked about this before, but I think it was just important. I, we talked about it this morning. I just think it was important to remind everybody we're still pursuing that. Uh, that has not fallen off of our radar. I'm of course reminded about it frequently, including when I drive over it. So I'm I'm in the same boat as everybody else. We're gonna we're gonna make some noise and try to get what we can. Lastly, we started discussing today our line painting program. So at some point uh, that'll take place as well. And then uh, as soon as we have a, you know, we're continuing to monitor what comes out of the federal government, not just the American. I always screw this up, but I think it's the American Recovery Plan (ARP). So that's the legislation that's already passed. We've discussed previously the $2.3 million coming from that pot of money. We have no guidance on how to spend it or appropriate it yet. So uh, when that day comes, we'll probably have a workshop and have a good robust conversation and, and, and figure out, okay, where do we go with it now? Uh, and then of course we have still a pending infrastructure bill that's being debated uh, at the congressional level and we don't know what that's gonna give us. So uh, we're just patiently waiting to see what we'll get from the feds, but we are moving ahead with what limited funds we can for, for some of our spring and, and summer work. Um, I think at this point, that's about all I have uh, at this time. Hey, thanks, Jay. I just have one thing and I'll open it up to the board for questions is I like to work with you to set a goal if possible that the board begin meeting in person again at the next regular schedule uh, board meeting in two weeks, if, if possible. And, and like you had indicated, um, have Zoom access for those that are supporting the meeting. Uh, we did, Christina had us doing this prior to going to Zoom completely. So I like to start to begin to move back to um, uh, have our meetings uh, uh, with everyone in attendance from the board as soon as we can. So we can talk about that and make sure it's safe and everything. And, um, well, I just want to give you a heads up. That's something I'd like to see if possible. We're going to yeah take a look at the logistics inside the selectmen's room, John. We, you know, we learned prior to switching to Zoom, uh, if you recall, we had some complaints from our constituents that the audio being broadcast from the selectmen's room yeah. through the, the cable channel was, was not strong. But yet when, when NBC TV was able to pull their audio from the Zoom feed, it was much stronger. So we're going to work with Dave Fabiano and his team uh, over there at NBC TV, figure out exactly what the best solution is, how to figure out how to get that video conference card in the room. You know, it's set up nicely now, so we have to make some modifications, but we're going to work on that. So it's really plug and play. We go in, we have our meeting, we're able to go from there. Anything that we can do to get, get back to normal, I think we're all thirsty for. And then eventually I, I would say for the boards, you know, that are meeting, you know, really prior to that six foot rule, you realize how close everybody was sitting. You know, at some point it's just gonna have to be personal preference, you know, what somebody wants to do uh, at that point. So uh, I would agree with you uh, as as nice as these meetings have been remotely, you know, it's, it's time to get back to it. But it, it, this has, I would suggest, you know, making a, a kind of a, a, an overarching statement. This has certainly modified the public process and we're gonna adapt. Yes, if I could. This is Joe. I concur wholeheartedly with John on this. Um, if we're able to have a finance committee meeting and a joint meeting with the selectmen in person, I see no reason why we, if space is a concern, why we can't conduct our selectmen's meetings uh, down at the memorial gym for the time being. And there's plenty of space for people wishing to come in. You could get the measurements of the area, how many people could be accommodated uh, through the COVID protocol. And I think this by Zoom is cumbersome, and I'm raring to get back to regular order. Okay, thank you, Joe. All right, for the board, let's go through. I I just want to mention that there is a logistical challenge with what was just proposed. Um, the complication with the Board of Selectmen meetings is the 
live feed to community television, which is something that we were not able to provide with a memorial school. It's why I believe the town administrator talked about speaking with the community television folks about the logistics for the selectmen's room, because currently the setup um, does not allow for um, the five of us to meet in the room with speakers in the television and the media cart. It is why um, in addition to the board or in, in addition to the town being in the red and in the yellow for the last several months um, that the decision was made to continue these remote meetings because we just couldn't provide that television access um, if we moved our meetings outside of that room and had internet access to help with that. So uh, there were lots of logistical uh, nightmares to complicate things even further. So I just wanted to state that. So yeah, if I could just also comment, um, I know that it's important to have the meetings uh, on public television, but I don't think it's mandatory that that has to be the case. I think we do that as a public service. <clears throat> and if we meet just a few weeks, uh, whatever it takes before we can get back into the town hall, um, I just think that it would be much better for us to meet at the Memorial School until we're, we can go into the uh, uh, town hall again. That's just my thoughts. Uh, as far as logistics, I, I'm sure that's true, but is it something that overshadows being able to meet rather than have it on television? I know it's popular. It's probably popular than more TV shows. I know a lot of people watch it, but once again, I, I want to get back to regular order because I don't enjoy doing my work via telephone, and I'm certainly not intact to want to be on Zoom. So once again, um, I just would like to state that for the record. All right, thank you both for your inputs. Jay and I will look into it and we'll get back to you. Um, in regards to Jay's uh, other comments, um, any questions from the board? We'll go around the room. Rick? Oh, phone wasn't cooperating. I couldn't unmute. <laughs> no, I have nothing. Okay. Uh, Joe, anything else? Uh, yeah, I have a few questions for Jay. Um, where do we stand on the Valley Street project um, as far as uh, the work that is being done there? Has that been complete? I haven't been able to get up that way. Yeah, I haven't either, Joe. I know that they had some remaining uh, work to do. They had some more pipe uh, to install, and then I think they've got a lot of the patching work back to do on the, on the road cuts. I was up there... Uh, Oh, I want to say probably a day or two before uh, Officer Evans' funeral, uh, maybe the day before, I went up there with uh, uh, DPW and they were sodding some areas. So I'll get a more specific update for you next time around. And um, I asked this some meetings ago, do you know where the outflow um, is? And with, this pending, with the rain that we've had, it would be a good time to check to see if the work that's been accomplished is doing what it was supposed to? Uh, I, you know, the, when we were in the middle of the project, oh, I would say probably, you know, last spring or summer, we had those downpours. We had a lot of issues. Uh, we had no complaints this time around or anything that, that reached my desk in, in terms of it. In terms of where the exact outfall is, no. We, we, at least I have not been informed where it exactly is. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, a few more questions and a comment. Um, I noticed uh, the other day that uh, some fencing was being repaired along the rail trail and the train tracks uh, just north of the Cook Street intersection. Um, yes. Who 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 paid for that work? Town of Adams responsibility, our insurance company, it was storm damage. So it, there was no cost to the town? Negative, no cost. Okay, that's good. And uh, my last concern is uh, the town common. Um, I happened to be driving by, I believe it was either yesterday or the day before, and I noticed that uh, Brandy Nelson was there along with uh, Becky Ferguson looking at the uh, the uh, town common. And I'd walked through there uh, many times prior to that. And once again, something that I had my hand slapped with, that whole uh, 
common is riddled with Japanese knotweed. Apparently, it came in when the soya was delivered. There must have been uh, some uh, cuttings because it doesn't take much for that to spread. And it's overrunning uh, that um, common. And you can't just get rid of that by mowing. It propagates even stronger. And so that's something that needs to be rectified quickly. And I can only see it as an extra cost um, or a mistake made by whoever brought in the topsoil. Also, a lot of the plantings along the back are riddled with rust, meaning that a lot of them are dying back. Um, Attention needs to be taken quickly to cut away that rust um, from them. They don't look very strong at all. And um, once again, um, a lot of people on our committee and people have asked me what's going on there, and I I can't tell them anymore. We don't have... We don't have the say anymore. It's the town of Adams. We're discontinued as a group. And I don't know what to tell people. It just seems like it's off the radar screen. You know, that statue sits there covered. There's been no talk of when we want to have the celebration, if we want to have one, when it's going to be, because you just can't say we're going to have it next week in order to make it fitting for what has been accomplished there, we're going to need at least a month's time to make uh, arrangements to get people to come. And, of course, we know we're going to, you'll get back to COVID. I'm sure that's the situation. But it just seems like that project is dropped off the radar screen. And, you know, I know some members and uh, people know who've been involved, and they've been asking, you know, when when's this going to happen? And And I can't tell them. I don't think anybody can tell them except for uh, because it's under the town now. So I haven't heard anything. Has there been any talk of when this uh, unveiling is going to take place? The answer to that is yes. First of all, I'm going to pass along all of the foliage issues to Becky so that she can work with the contractor on it. Well, she was there. Okay. Becky was there at the meeting. She was there. I happened to drive by, and I saw him on the site, and I was going to bring it up to the meeting tonight, but I know Becky walked with Brandy, and Brandy, who is the landscaper for people listening, Brandy Nelson for the landscaping company that we hired to oversee the project, and she was very concerned about that Japanese knotweed because, um, as you know, I... I got censored by the uh, Conservation Commission, and I was wrong with what I did. But let me tell you, folks, that this Japanese knotweed is something to try hard to contend with. I know the area that I did, and I won't prolong the conversation, is already growing Japanese knotweed again. So... Once again, it's killing our riparian zones. It's a monoculture. It blocks out the growth of anything else, and it's very troublesome troublesome to see it in the town common because it's no easy fix to eradicate it. And uh, I think that's all I uh, have uh, for you, Jay, uh, for tonight. Okay, Joe. Will do. Thank you. Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. I just want to follow up to Joe's question about the um, ceremony for the unveiling of the Susan B. Anthony statue. Do you have any updates on that? Uh, a lot of people have questions about that. Yes, they, they do. And, and everybody also needs to understand, too, that we've been asked to do quite a bit of stuff at, at, at Town Hall with limited staff. You know, Officer Evans' funeral was actually very uh, time consuming, et cetera. So, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff uh, reacting to things. Uh, I, my office and I can only handle so much. Uh, so I asked uh, at the time who the chairman of the select board was, if they would be willing to, to plan an event for some time in June, uh, working with the community development office, at what point would the town common be presentable in order to invite elected officials, et cetera, and do right by the statue, do right by town common. We think at this time we're shooting for late June. I asked uh, chairman Hoyt again at the time, now member Hoyt, in order to arrange that. And I believe that she found another volunteer helper with, and that has been going on in the background, but we need to solidify some dates. Uh, At this point, we're trying to recruit some 
uh, state officials. And unfortunately, their calendars are, are hard to nail down. Christine, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that. But yes, we are working on it in, in the background. We want to do what's right for the committee. And we want to do what's right for Susan's statue uh, as well. I can just um, mention that community development has been uh, communicating with me about the um, when town common should be um, ready. Uh, I was told yesterday by community development about the issues that uh, Joe raised this evening. Um, so that was the first I had heard of that. Um, and they assure me that the end of June is still probably a good time. Um, probably it might be the week of, uh, it'll be the end of June. Um, and that is the information that we are um, getting out to some state officials to see if their calendars would line up with the end of June to do an unveiling. Um, and, and at that point, that's where the conversation is at. We're looking at some state official um, calendars. The other, I think the other thing too, Joe, that was on the, the radar to try to fix, which was going to be, it was, I think Brian had to come back one more time, Brian's a sculptor, because I don't think that repair held. I remember Becky saying something that she needed to look one more time into that repair uh, on that front facing step. So that was the other thing for, from a timeline standpoint, uh, Becky was monitoring for us. That, that has been taken care of. Okay, the, there's good. a brass uh, over it and it, it looks fine what was done. It doesn't break up because it's a quote and stair top number one and stair top uh, three, because there's three steps are bibliograph biographical in nature and date, so it doesn't hurt um, the sequence of looking at it. It would have been much different if the young Susan covered either the step uh, one or step three. It would have been kind of a, a lot of work to fix it, but it, it looks good because it matches uh, the rest of the statue. So Good. that has been taken care of. Brian wasn't able to come up and do it personally, but he sent his crew up uh, who does all of his setting to um, make that fix. So okay. that has been taken care of. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, great. Christine, do you have any other questions for Jay? Nope, I do not. Sorry. That's okay. Um, Howard. I do not have any questions. Thank you. Okay. All right. Moving on to town council report. Attorney St. John. Uh, thank you. Uh, since my last report, I spoke with a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals regarding the suit for judicial review of the use variance that was granted to a marijuana cultivator. I've also had conversations with the attorney for the cultivator and the attorney for the objector. I've spoken with no COVID related continuance of At time. The district court is unable to conduct trial proceedings on civil cases until it receives permission from the state trial court's office. I prepared for a hearing on a board of health code enforcement matter. I researched a question concerning what the Board of Selectmen may do if vacancies exist on other boards caused by a failure to elect, which is what you discussed earlier tonight. In accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 41, Section 11, the Selectmen are allowed to appoint persons to fill vacancies in collaboration with existing board members. I discussed the proposed purchase and sale agreement of the 26 Commercial Street property with the attorney for the seller. And I discussed the boundary line matter with staff and with the attorney for the property owner. And that is it. Okay, thank you. Any questions for attorney St. John from the board? Hearing none, moving on to the next item is subcommittee and liaison reports. Rick? I have nothing. Joe. I have nothing. Look. <laughs> Christine. Yeah. TV. I think I am. I was like, we, we can still hear you, coach. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to report out um, earlier today, I believe all of us received an invitation 
to attend a Zoom meet and greet with the Western Mass Director for the Office of the Governor, um, Jose Delgado. It was a, an invitation that Deb had sent around to all of us um, from Andy Hoagland and the Berkshire County um, Selectmen's Association. So I did attend that um, at six o'clock this evening. It was good to um, represent the town of Adams at that space. Um, Jose did talk a little bit about all of the economic development updates from the governor and the lieutenant governor, what they have been announcing over the course of the last several weeks. Um, and they talked about a couple of different um, upcoming programs. The one that is um, coming up with a deadline is the Shared Streets and Spaces program with a deadline of May 21st. Um, I know, Jay, you had worked with some staff to um, start looking at some possible uh, grant opportunities. So I know that that deadline's coming up quickly. And they also mentioned the um, LRRP. Um, and I believe that there's a public um, meeting coming up with that group soon to talk about the survey results. So it was good that that was on um, the Office of the Governor's mind and that we had the opportunity to to speak with him. There were only a few selectmen on the call, uh, so we actually all got uh, a lot of uh, FaceTime, you know, Zoom FaceTime with, uh, with our new rep in the Western Mass office. So just wanted to report that out to the board. Okay, thank you. And Howard, I assume you have nothing to add for the subcommittee liaison reports as of today? That is correct. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll have to fix that. Yeah, real quick. Huh? <laughs> and finally, announcements and good of the order. Rick? Just real quick, I'd like to congratulate John and Howard on their election, as well as our other elected officials in town. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Joe? Uh, yes, I'd like to follow up um, on what Rick uh, had just said. Um, Congratulations to you um, um, for winning both of you, John and Howard. And Howard, um, I saw your bio and I was very impressed with uh, your credentials as far as educationally. Um, Stanford and MIT, they're the best. So best of luck to you and I'm looking forward to working with you uh, in the future. And uh, Best of luck, and I'd also, it's tough to put yourself out there, and although Don Summers uh, came in third, um, I'd still like to congratulate him for his willingness to step forward and try to serve our community, and that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, Christine? Um, one announcement, and it's regarding vaccines. So, um, we are at a point where, you know, a number of people have um, had vaccine appointments or have been able to get vaccine appointments, but we do also realize that there are individuals who might not have access to computers, might not have um, the ability to register online. So uh, starting this week, there have been walk-in appointments at the three vaccination locations in the Berkshires. Today, there was a walk-in um, clinic at, in Great Barrington. Um, tomorrow, there are walk-in appointments at the North Adams Clinic from 12 to 5 p.m. There are 300 um, walk-in appointments available. You will still have to bring a photo ID in your health insurance information. Um, in, there are also appointments available if you wanted to pre-register beforehand. Um, but there is a clinic tomorrow. It is Pfizer um, doses. It is from 12 to 5 p.m. in North Adams. There's also a clinic in Pittsfield from 4 to 7 p.m. If you know anybody who still needs a vaccine, um, who's been unable to register, please, please, please um, encourage them to go and get vaccinated tomorrow. Because um, I don't know when we'll get this many doses again to the county. And I don't know um, if there will be another walk-in kind of appointment process uh, going forward as these um, clinics are starting to wind down. I know the governor announced earlier this week that the mass vaccination clinics, I believe he was closing four of them. 
and they will be pushing the vaccines um, to pharmacy, doctors, et cetera. Um, and these clinics will start to close. So this is really the time if you haven't been vaccinated to, to get out there and go. So call a neighbor, call a friend, let them know. Thanks. Okay, very good. And Howard, anything to add? I, I don't, thank you. Okay. I do, oh yes, I want to that uh, I'm happy, happy to be serving with you folks and I look forward to working with you uh, as we move forward. And, uh, I, there's a lot to learn. I just got unloaded on with a lot of uh, manuals. So it'll yeah. take me a bit to catch up. Thank you. Sorry, sure. sorry Howard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all we have left is a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Rick, do we have a second? I'll second. Second by Christine. Second by Christine. Discussion? Carry none, all those in favor? Aye. Roll call vote. Joe's right. Roll call it. <laughs> Joe, thank you, sir. Okay, roll call votes. Rick. Yes. Joe. Yes. Christine. Yes. Howard. Yes. And yes, it is now official. Thank you very much. Good meeting. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.